Hey, it's Dr. Silva, thanks for joining me. Today I'm gonna to tell you about nortriptyline. Nortriptyline, also called Panelor by its brand name way back in the day. It is a tricyclic agent, so it belongs to the first generation of antidepressant medications, all of which were serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. They block the reuptake of the neurotransmitters of serotonin and norepinephrine at the synapse, the gap between neurons where neurons are communicating with each other, thereby increasing the concentration of those chemicals and the actions that those chemicals underlie. And there are other videos that will talk about that more specifically, but although it is an SNRI, it is really the serotonergic reuptake inhibition is negligible. Like dizipramine, nortriptyline is largely noradrenergic. It much more blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine than it does serotonin. In fact, like dizipramine, it is fairly safe to combine with monoamine oxidase inhibitors in terms of the risk of serotonin syndrome. You still have to worry about hypertensive crisis, and I'm not saying that you should be cavalier about combining really any antidepressant with the MAOI class, but but this medication is more noradrenergic. And then in the prefrontal cortex, when you block the reuptake of norepinephrine, you also happen to increase dopamine, the other monoamine neurotransmitter, because there are no dopamine reuptake pumps in that part of the brain. And that's useful for attention and concentration and motivation. Protriptyline is FDA approved for the treatment of major depression, but it is used off-label to treat a great many conditions. Of the tricyclic agents, again, along with dizipramine, it would be probably the last one that I would choose to help with anxiety because that's really a serotonergic function. You would really want to increase serotonin. But like the other tricyclics, it is also used to treat insomnia. That's really mediated through the antihistaminergic effects. It blocks the H1 histamine receptor subtype, and that causes sedation in the central nervous system. Protriptyline is good for chronic pain, especially neuropathic pain, and that mechanism does involve the increase of norepinephrine at the level of the spinal cord. So in theory, nortriptyline and dizipramine should be superior to the other tricyclics, but this is all off-label. No one's proven to the FDA that these medications are effective in a statistically significant way. They are in clinical practice. We wouldn't use them off-label if they didn't work. But other forms of neuropathic pain, which is pain that has to do with damage to the nervous system itself, the peripheral nervous system itself, you can also prevent migraines, so migraine headache prophylaxis. And like all the other tricyclic agents, nortriptyline can be used for treatment-resistant depression because there is some evidence that the tricyclics might be more effective. I think SNRIs in general tend to be more effective. And again, every time I say SNRI, when I'm talking about nortriptyline, it's really, I should be saying an NRI. It's really closer to Stratera than to Effexor or Cymbalta. It's also used off-label for smoking cessation and cocaine because it is so noradrenergic. And like Welbutrin, which blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine, Welbutrin, bupropion, was actually marketed as Zyban. It was actually FDA approved for smoking cessation. So there is actually some research to show that by blocking the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine, that you decrease cravings for nicotine. and Cocaine, that hasn't been shown, but it's used off-label and we don't have any magic bullets. The dosage range for nortriptyline is akin to the other tricyclic agents, 75 to 150 milligrams, typically with an accepted maximum of 300 milligrams. That can vary depending on the individual's volume distribution. So some experts might go higher than 300. It's not common and you get a lot of side effects at those higher doses, but Nortriptyline is actually unique in that it has an established therapeutic window. There's research that has established that if you have 
serum blood concentrations of less than 50 nanograms per deciliter, you're unlikely to get efficacy because the blood levels are too low. That's intuitive. But there's also evidence to show that if you have very high blood levels, greater than 150 nanograms per deciliter in most people, that you begin to lose efficacy for depression as well. And so there's this idea that you actually want to shoot for between 50 and 150 nanograms per deciliter. And those again are serum blood concentrations. So whatever dose you have to give to achieve those serum drug levels, depending on a patient's volume of distribution and how they metabolize nortriptyline, the pharmacokinetics in that particular individual, which will also be affected by drug-drug interactions, other medications that, for example, inhibit the cytochrome P450 system of enzymes, and specifically 2D6. Side effects. Well, first of all, the nonspecifics. Nausea. Any medication can cause nausea. Headaches. Diarrhea. Dizziness. Fatigue. Those are nonspecific side effects. A big one, though, is sedation. And we think this is mediated by these medications' antihistaminergic effects. So they're essentially antihistamines. And so they block the H1 type of histamine receptor, the type of, that's involved in seasonal allergies, not the type that's involved in your stomach acid. We're talking about blocking the H1 receptors. They are found in the central nervous system and they result in sedation, which can be very significant. Mirtazapine is a tetracyclic, a little bit more modern antidepressant that's used a lot, and it too creates sedation through its antihistamine effect. So you wanna dose these medications at bedtime, you want to try to use them as sleep agents as well as antidepressants. And if you do have to dose them throughout the day, you want the larger dose to be at bedtime. Weight gain is another real problem with these agents. They increase the appetite. They don't change the metabolism. They increase the appetite, especially for carbohydrates. For some reason, you're not gonna crave broccoli, but the pastas and the sugary sweet foods, you're really gonna want those more, and you're gonna gain weight from that, and it could cause metabolic syndrome. Type two diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, elevated cholesterol, as well as a bad ratio of the quote-unquote good cholesterol to the bad cholesterol, dyslipidemia. You really do have to weigh patients at baseline and monitor them very carefully. That's a huge drawback and a deal breaker for a lot of patients. They also, all of them, to some extent or another, block muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So they're anticholinergic and you get all of the side effects that go with that from dry mouth to constipation to urinary retention to blurred vision blurred vision because it impairs accommodation so you get blurred near vision the pupils can't accommodate all of these medications can cause sexual dysfunction, mostly anorgasmia and a lowered libido because of the serotonergic actions, but you can also get erectile dysfunction. That could be a consequence of a low libido, but it could also be a direct effect of norepinephrine, which inhibits the parasympathetic nervous system and it interferes with the erection in a lot of men, particularly men that are middle-aged and they might have other risk factors like cardiovascular disease, chronic hypertension, etc. Orthostasis, orthostatic hypotension, is a loss of blood pressure, a drop in blood pressure in the cranium upon standing. Ortho means upright, erect, stasis to stand. And so when you get up, especially if you've been lying down or even sitting down and you come to a standing position, the blood pools due to gravity and your vasculature is supposed to compensate by constricting to maintain pressure, but you get interference with that system with these medications. And that can lead to dizziness and even fainting and falling. We do see severe hypotension in overdose. You want to get a baseline EKG in your patients that are older than 50 because these agents can also cause QTC 
prolongation. QTC stands for the corrected QT interval, and that refers to the electrocardiogram, the QRST complex, which measures in milliseconds the length of a heartbeat. So in patients who already have varying degrees of heart block, you want to avoid using tricyclic agents or in patients that already have arrhythmias because prolongation of the QTC could lead to fatal arrhythmia, a torsade point, which looks like this and looks like this. Again, these medications are fatal in overdose. You see seizures, arrhythmias, fatal arrhythmias, coma, and death. Definitely not a good choice for patients that are chronically suicidal or the patients who are prone to overdose. Other side effects include sweating, increased sweating, because you have the increased norepinephrine, and so upon exertion, but also you could, in theory, have hot flashes as well, temperature dysregulation, that's due to increased serotonin. I have another video, it's an instant replay, on sweating, on drug-induced sweating, so you can check that out for more information. Heartburn has been reported, a weird taste in the mouth, that can happen. These are not as common. Akathisia, which is a motor restlessness, a fidgetiness, a need to move and feeling very uncomfortable if you can't move. In the extreme, it takes the form of pacing, but probably more commonly you would see fidgeting, squirming, inability to, to stay seated, maybe a bouncing knee or a tapping toe. That's called akathisia and it's due to increased serotonin, which is antagonizing dopamine in certain regions of the brain. You can also see rarely the induction of mania in those individuals who are susceptible to it. So patients with bipolar spectrum illness, you're not going to see mania in patients that aren't prone to manic episodes. Even in overdose, you're not going to see mania unless you have a person who's bipolar. And similarly, patients that are vulnerable to psychosis would be at increased risk theoretically, but this is rare. Controversial side effect would be suicidal ideations. Any antidepressant in theory, especially in young impulsive people, could in theory increase suicidal ideations and even behaviors. This is controversial. It's not really been proven. I am on the side of there's really very little proof of that, and I certainly don't worry about it in really any of my patients. Definitely not in patients that are older. But I warn all patients about it. I ask all patients about suicidality, whether they've had problems with depression or not. And I do caution them that if they start to have thoughts, weird thoughts, to let me know. In a young, impulsive patient, you really do have to be careful about that. Drug-drug interactions that you want to be careful about is combining any of the tricyclics, really, with a medication that can increase the QTC interval. That's the corrected QT interval in the electrocardiogram. So if you have medications like melaril, thyridazine, or ORAP, pimazide, these are first-generation antipsychotic agents, which also have mood-stabilizing properties. They're not used much, very much anymore because they're, they're dinosaurs, the first-generation agents. ORAP was actually used for Tourette's and tick disorders in children, but it's actually FDA approved, I believe. But they increase the QTC interval, so you wouldn't want to combine them with tricyclic agents. There are also some antibiotics and some antiarrhythmic agents that do the same. And then, of course, if you're using a beta blocker, which is going to slow the heart rate, that could be problematic. And any patients that already have pre existing heart block, you want to be careful combining the tricyclic agents with other anticholinergic agents because you could get hyperthermia and and delirium and death. You can also get a paralytic ileus. You could slow down gastrointestinal motility. It can grind to an absolute halt, and that can be very dangerous, very deadly as well. And that's really all there is to say about nortriptyline.